All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our first in the series of virtual histories. We're very excited to have Jackson Gilman Ferlini here to give the inaugural lecture. And it's been so great to see so many people uh, signing up for this. Uh, my name is Nathan Dennys. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the Baltimore Architecture Foundation from my home in Woodbury. And I want to begin by saying how thankful we are to everyone who donated to be with us today. Your donations will support both the BAF and Baltimore Heritage during a time of significant need. COVID-19 has seriously impacted program revenue with both of our organizations. That said, we're doing our best to adapt to these extraordinary times with engaging virtual programming that's accessible to everyone from home. And before I introduce Jackson, I'd like to plug the next presentation in the virtual history series, Baltimore's rem remarkable infrastructure from gas lamps to clean water with architect and BAF board member, Tom Liebel. I hope you will join us again on May 1st and please donate if you can. Now I'd like to introduce Jackson Gilman Ferlini, Historic Preservation Officer from the Baltimore City Department of General Services and a BAF board member. Jackson manages the city's historic properties, including the Baltimore War Memorial. He earned a master's degree in historic preservation from Goucher College, where his thesis dealt with the adaptive reuse of monuments and memorials. So Jackson, you can start sharing your screen now to open up the presentation. Okay. And do that, I want to mention to everybody that if you have questions during the presentation, to please use the chat box on Zoom, and we'll get to the questions at the end of Jackson's presentation. Thank you. Okay, just one second. All right. Uh, thank you all for being here, and uh, thanks to the BAF and uh, Baltimore Heritage for asking me to speak today. I'm very excited to be with you. Uh, my name is Jackson Gilman Forlini, and uh, in my capacity as Historic Preservation Officer with Department of General Services, I oversee preservation of city-owned historic buildings. And one of those uh, is this building. This is the Baltimore War Memorial. It was constructed in 1925, and it's a World War I memorial in downtown Baltimore. It's what you call a living memorial um, because it has a sort of a functional space attached to it. Uh, there's a 1,000 seat auditorium inside. Uh, it's very beautiful, very grand and monumental. But when I started working for the city in 2012, um, this building was largely forgotten. Um, even though we have all this space inside, uh, this hall most of the year actually sat empty. Um, and the building was really starting to show signs of wear and tear and was run down and forgotten by a lot of people. Actually, even today, I meet a lot of folks who say, you know, I've lived in Baltimore my whole life, born and raised, and I've never been in here. I didn't really even know this existed. Um, and so, oh, uh, let's see, was there an issue with the, um, can you still see my screen? Yeah, we could see your screen, Jackson. I think it just opened up the, a, a different window. Oh, I see, okay, hold on one second. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. So um, it had been empty for a long time, and and this was gotten just got me thinking. How is it that something like a monument that was intended to be permanent, sort of immutable carrier of memory, how is it that it was able to be forgotten and not really succeeding in its original intent? Um, the um, so, oh, sorry. I think it. I think when someone else logs on, it might. Uh, you can share your screen again. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, then a few years after I started working for the city, um, we came to uh, this event, uh, an event that I'm sure a lot of you are probably remember, um, the uh, taking down of the Confederate monuments. Um, and so this is another example where, you know, the intention of a monument um, was not borne out in the long term, um, whether forgotten 
or uh, you know, removed. Uh, the symbolic value of any kind of monument, I think, has to be accepted by the community at large. After all, a symbol is only as good so long as everyone agrees that's what it means. Um, and I came to the conclusion with both of these examples and in my academic research that the monument doesn't preserve memory. Um, actually, it's the other way around, that a memory is what preserves the monument. Memory as an external thing separate from its physical reminders. Uh, and you can find evidence of this uh, going back actually to the original monument. Uh, this is the equestrian monument of Marcus Aurelius in Rome. And this is the only surviving equestrian monument left from antiquity. Well, why is that? It wasn't the only one constructed, but it was the only one that survived iconoclasm by the early Christians because they mistakenly believed that this represented Constantine, the first Christian emperor, and not Marcus Aurelius. And so they saved it. Um, and so we find that this question monument, which by the way served as the model for all subsequent ones, including the Lee Jackson monument in Baltimore, um, we find that it was actually preserved because of a reinvention of its symbolic meaning. Um, and so there, it's because of this changing of the monuments that it actually was able to be preserved. Um, now, how is, this, how is this able to happen? How is it that collective memory is so in, unstable? Uh, well, recently psychologists have actually found that uh, collective memory could really more appropriately be called collective forgetting. Um, and there's a psychologist, uh, Henry Rodiger at, the, at Washington University in St. Louis, uh, who was able to, over a 40-year uh, longitudinal study, map and track how the public could and does forget a piece of un once universally known collective memory, uh, or the, the recall of that memory. And he used the names of presidents as an example. Uh, and what this study showed was that actually um, collective memory is very, very temporary and um, really only lasts about 80 years or so. After about two or three generations, 80 years, um, the number of people who can remember a once universally known piece of memory drops uh, to about 14% and then levels off from there out. Um, and we find this is even more true today as Google has kind of become the custodian of collective memory as well. Uh, the empirical research also shows something interesting, which is that one's lived experience is more important for collective memory than what historians will assign to historical events in terms of their significance. Um, in other words, what we are living now is, is what forms that, that collective memory much more strongly. Uh, and so monuments need to be able to accommodate the creation of new memory. Uh, and to do that, they need spatial characteristics for the public to experience. See, older monuments and a lot of public art today um, actually, I think, assume too much that there's a general consensus in the public uh, in terms of what is important and what is being remembered. Um, and so that's why they take sort of monolithic forms. You know, the equestrian monument is a, is a monolith. Um, but also, it's not just a monolith in form, but also in its symbolic meaning. Uh, we need to accept, and I think this psychological research shows, we need to accept that memorials alone can't memorialize history long term by themselves. Uh, sooner or later, that original commemorative value is going to be forgotten by a majority of people. Uh, so the question is, what do we do with monuments whose history we've forgotten? And uh, I came to the conclusion that we need to apply the modern architectural practice of adaptive reuse or uh, adaptive use, as some people call it, uh, to its signifiers of its symbolism. And, uh, but this raises some questions, doesn't it? Because on its surface, first of all, how do you preserve something by changing it? Isn't that, you're, aren't you losing some integrity there? Uh, and then also, the other question is, isn't this sort of antithetical to the whole purpose of a monument in the first place, something which never changes? Well, in order to help answer these questions, uh, I looked to uh, the Borough Charter, which is a set of sort of philosophical principles developed by the Australian chapter of ICOMOS, the International Council on Monuments and Sites. 
And the Borough Charter gives us sort of a window into how to be thinking about these places. And I'll quote you uh, from it. Change may be necessary to retain cultural significance, but it is undesirable where it reduces cultural significance. The amount of change to a place and its use should be guided by the cultural significance of the place and its appropriate interpretation. It may be appropriate to change a place where this reflects a change in cultural meanings or practices at the place. Uh, now, this is a little more flexible than preservation philosophy in the United States. Um, many of you are probably familiar with the Secretary of the Interior Standards, which largely assumes that significance is intrinsic to the building material. Uh, that a historic resource is important or significant because, you know, that stone that was placed there 200 years ago, it was touched by the hands of its creator and therefore it is an authentic argument or uh, uh, artifact rather. But what the Burr Charter does is it relaxes this a little bit into thinking about significance not as tied necessarily to the physical material, but as an external idea. Um, which exists separate from its physical signifiers. And this gives us uh, a way of applying adaptive use to monuments. Um, and, and the idea of adaptive use, changing the use of it serves a new function, but changing only what's that which is absolutely necessary to do so, um, and preserving the essence of the original in some way. Uh, being mindful, of course, always that there will be a minority of people who will continue to attribute that original uh, meaning. Now I can hear the skeptics in the back of the room right now being like, well, just because the Australians say this, does that mean it's true? Uh, well, I will say that if there are any Australians listening to this webinar right now, uh, you are vindicated because uh, actually there are quite a lot of historical precedents for this. And let me go into some of them. So um, this is particularly uh, what I'm describing was done a lot in Renaissance Italy. And what we have here is a 16th century engraving of the relocation of Caligula's obelisk to the square at St. Peter in the Vatican. And um, this was done by Pope Sixtus V, uh, who believed that the obelisk had witnessed the martyrdom of St. Peter. And so he wanted to recontextualize it uh, and sort of reclaim its symbolism to serve uh, the, the uh, mission of the Catholic Church at this time. Um, which, by the way, was the second time that this was done. Uh, the obelisk was originally an ancient Egyptian monument that had been recontextualized by the Emperor Caligula and moved to Rome as a sign of Rome's military conquest over Egypt. Um, but what's so interesting about this is, first of all, it was very difficult uh, relocating this giant solid piece of granite, uh, inverting it, you can see on the scaffold, and then sledging it through the streets of Rome. But also, the intent behind it, the records left behind by Pope Sixtus are clear uh, that moving the obelisk was actually an intentional decision to deliberately reinvent its symbolic meaning. Um, this was not iconoclasm like we saw with the earlier Roman monuments. This was reinventing and recycling materials in a way that both suited prevailing beliefs, but also respected the past. Now, if we accept that change is necessary, the next question is, well, what kinds of changes should we be making? Uh, what makes a successful monument now if we're going to be altering it? And um, what I found is that you need to have ambiguity and abstraction to reflect all of those constant changes uh, and, and lack of consensus in the collective memory. But um, uh, in, a good example of that um, is uh, this memorial. This is the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C., designed by Maya Lin, uh, built in 1980. And um, what makes this, I, I think this is one of the most successful memorials of the 20th century. Um, and everything else really stands in its shadow, everything after it. What makes it so successful is that it doesn't advance a particular way of thinking about things as forcefully as some of the older memorials and monuments do. Um, it's more open to interpretation, uh, but it also isn't so abstract that it doesn't provide a point of reference. Its spatial characteristics also help visitors form new memories through the act of movement uh, through it. 
And those are the kinds of characteristics that we need to be introducing to older memorials and monuments, those spatial characteristics and also that ambiguity and abstraction. So let's go back now to Baltimore, um, city we all love, uh, and apply this to our war memorial. Now, uh, my coworker and I, Joshua Bornfield, um, when we realized that we needed to sort of reinvigorate the site and re-engage the public, we looked to the performing arts. We had this large hall. And so we did things like uh, rock opera. Um, we had the Baltimore Rock Opera Society perform there at Light City. Uh, we had classical symphonic music, concerts, fashion shows became quite popular. Baltimore Fashion Week was held there. Uh, and we also had a um, uh, theater as well. Uh, but uh, all of these things, while good at getting people in the door, um, never really, we didn't quite make the same kind of connection to the original historical artifact. In other words, the, 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 the monumental aspects of the building. Um, until 2018, we had a breakthrough. And that was this exhibit, which is After Image Requiem by uh, local artists, uh, Kay Ito and Andrew Paul Kuyper. And what this did, um, Ito created these um, images on the floor there that you see of uh, his body, in, uh, which are actually light exposures on photostatic paper in life size. And Kuiper created a soundscape that was pumped throughout the hall. And it created this very kind of surreal um, sense of foreboding. Uh, the, the, this exhibit was meant to evoke the horrors of the atom bomb drop on Hiroshima during World War II. And it was itself a kind of commemorative artwork, uh, although different than the original commemoration of the building. But what made this so successful was that we were able to observe a, that it elicited a reaction from visitors where they drew an emotional connection between the artwork and the original architecture. Uh, after experiencing the artwork, they would move through it and then they would start moving outward toward the outer walls where we had the names of the World War I dead engraved on the walls. And they would touch the walls. They laid on the ground in some cases. Um, it was a real uh, uh, emotional experience for them that had this logical link in their mind between sort of the violent death of World War II and, and Hiroshima and the violent death of World War I. And also there was a sort of a deliberate conflict there between the triumphalism of the original memorial and the more somber sort of nature of the artwork. So this was very exciting for us. And uh, we built on this uh, the following year um, by having Submersive Productions, a local uh, immersive theater company, do this show. Uh, this is a performance called Mass Rabble in April 2019. Uh, and this was very different uh, in that it was participatory. We had about 30 actors who uh, were moving throughout the space and engaging with visitors, uh, exploring some heavy themes, contemporary themes like mass migration, uh, borders and boundaries, uh, also war and violence as well. And it was almost kind of like a participatory um, interpretive dance. It had that abstraction that I was talking about, that had the ambiguity, but it also had reference points, and it was very spatially oriented. It made a great use of the building, all the little nooks and crannies, and um, the people were doing things, again, the visitors doing things like laying on the floor and really thinking about the space that they were in, in a meaningful way. We had about 500 participants that came through during a two week uh, run of the show. Uh, and these were both really exciting ways that we could reinvigorate the space and, and do different kinds of uses that were not traditional commemorative uses, uh, but which were still ways of sort of building upon the foundation that had been laid by the original. But I want to leave you with sort of the, what I think is maybe a little bit something a little more mundane, uh, but maybe more interesting, which is this. Uh, now, this is might just look like a bunch of bored people waiting around inside the War Memorial, and that's exactly what it is. Uh, and this is how it gets used most of the time. This is the uh, Youth Works Summer Jobs Registration, which uh, happens every March. We have thousands of Baltimore City youth come through the building who sign up to get uh, or to apply for a summer job. And, uh, you know, this has been going on for a lot of years and, you know, mostly just because it's convenient. It's downtown, we've got a big space for them to use and they can come and, you know, they can register. But what's interesting was a couple years ago, uh, I had a tour, 
uh, gave a tour of the building to a group of undergraduate students from Goucher College. Uh, they were actually in a historic preservation class. And uh, they came into the building and one of the students, his eyes lit up and he got excited and he says, there was this moment of recognition in his face and says, oh, I know this building. This is the YouthWorks building. Uh, to him, it wasn't the War Memorial. He didn't know anything about the War Memorial. He didn't really even know where he was going, but he had that memory. And you know, for an entire generation of Baltimore City youth, they know this as the YouthWorks building because they have that collective memory of going and jointly getting the, their first job, their first job in high school and the excitement of that and, and setting them up uh, for success in later years. And I think this, it really shows the, the complex way in which collective memory is formed. You know, we can design cool exhibits and new uses for buildings, but you know, at the same time, there's also a sort of an organic process that happens to collective memory that we really can't control, nor, nor should we. Um, you know, I think that if the whole generation thinks of this as youth works building, then that's probably fine because it's still accomplishing the idea of preserving the building and keeping it relevant. Um, and it's also kind of a good thing if one monument means many different things to many different people, uh, because that's a little bit more truthful representation of our collective memory, which as we saw is constantly changing um, and things are being forgotten and new memories are being formed. And so uh, we need to find ways of accommodating all of those different kinds of memories. Because a more truthful memorial is honestly one that's more likely to be preserved. Um, so I'll just conclude by saying um, that you know, this example and others, I think we need to be thinking about not just what a monument was intended to say, uh, but asking what collective memories already exist, maybe separate from it, um, and then trying to accommodate them at memorials so that the memorial can actually reflect the memory of our lived experience. Um, and so uh, thinking about how we can change them and, and adapt them to, to new people um, should be on the minds of, of preservationists and just members of the public. So um, that's the end of my uh, talk. I uh, thank you all for being here and I look forward to any questions that you might have. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jackson. Um, I have the uh, first question that we have here is, is um, a, a his, historical question about the War Memorial. And the question is, uh, was the War Memorial building used to swear in city council members during the 1960s and 1970s? Uh, yes, it was. Um, it's been used for all sorts of different uh, municipal events. Um, it's still used for city council swearing in and uh, mayoral swearing in um, ceremonies. Uh, it's, it's, it gets a variety of different uses and, you know, time prohibited me from going into all of them in my in my talk, but it now gets about 50 to 60,000 visitors a year, uh, which is way up from between 10 and 20 when I first started in 2012. Um, our record keeping wasn't great back then, so it's sort of hard to estimate, but, but yes, it, it is used for those types of events. Thank you. And the next question is, um, if you know of any images of the way the building was used when it was first built, if you can speak to how the building was first used. Yeah, so initially that hall was intended to be a gathering place for uh, veterans organizations, uh, the American Legion, the VFW, uh, which were new organizations at the end of World War I. And um, they didn't really have a large assembly space in Baltimore City. And so the building was constructed as a joint initiative between city and state government in order to provide them that, that meeting space. Um, and it's still used that way today. Uh, the American Legion, the VFW still have uh, office space in the building, they're there every day, and um, they still have ceremonies. Um, but, you know, a lot of, something that's been in the news a lot in the last few years is that these types of organizations are on the decline in terms of membership nationwide. This is a nationwide phenomenon. Uh, and so those types of events, while basically constituted 100% of the building's use in 1925, um, just there just aren't the number of people to sustain that only now. Okay, next question is, could you speak to the repurposing of uh, Civil War monuments in the South? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, it, as I'm, I'm assuming it means as a as a sort of a, as a hypothetical. Um, 
it, you know, monuments are a little bit more static, monolithic monuments, uh, an obelisk, a column, a statue. They're a little bit more difficult to work with in applying some of these principles because they don't have the same spatial characteristics that a living memorial might have or that you know, later 20th century memorials have. So it's a little bit more challenging to repurpose them. Uh, well, there's one artist who has tried doing this, uh, oh, a few actually. Um, one that comes to mind is there's a Japanese artist named Tatsu Nishi uh, who works a lot with more traditional statuary and columns. And what he does is actually constructs these very elaborate domestic interiors in and around the monument. So you can't see it from the public anymore. You have to go into a little house that's built over it. And then you see the monument juxtaposed with a very unexpected interior, uh, like a bedroom, for example. Uh, he did a show in 2012 in um, New York uh, with the Columbus monument, Columbus statue, Columbus Square, where you actually climbed a tower and you walked into a penthouse suite and Columbus, this giant granite monument of, to Columbus was standing right there. Uh, and so it's an interesting way of playing with how we perceive something without actually physically altering it. Altering its environment alone can often be an effective way of repurposing it. And I would, I would think that there are opportunities to do that with the Civil War monuments as well. How can people find out about events at the War Memorial? We need to do a better job of publicizing them. Uh, I, I will admit that. Uh, the, we have a website up. It's not very helpful though, so don't, don't even bother. Uh, unless you want to schedule an event and then that's the place to go. Uh, warmemorial.baltimorecity.gov. Uh, generally, we leave it to the individual organizers of these events to promote their own. Uh, so a lot of times they'll have their own social media account or website where they'll promote their event. Um, but a calendar, sort of a centralized calendar is something we're still working on. Great. And how can this interpretive approach be applied to other city-owned historic buildings? Um, yeah, so, you know, generally speaking, when we think about other historic buildings, we're talking about them in monumental terms. Um, 19th century preservationists actually drew comparisons between ancient monuments and buildings like Notre Dame, uh, that it had become, through the test of time, monumental in its characteristics. And so, uh, you know, I think there, that there are ways of looking at this. I mean, adaptive use is used a lot for uh, historic buildings already. Um, and I think there's a little bit more tension, though, with commemorative buildings because their purpose is assumed to be fixed. And then that's sort of why I focus my research. But there are plenty of uh, opportunities with other historic buildings um, where we can find new uses for them that are still compatible with their historic appearance. Can't go into all of them now, though. Okay, I, I see that some people are posting links to some of the um, some of the artists you were talking about, which is really helpful. So thank you. For oh yeah, Dave. Uh, there's an American questions. architect named David Gisson, G I S S O N, who also um, is exploring some of these ideas as well for uh, within the design lens for contemporary design. Um, the next question is, um, why is your focus on current interpretation rather than um, uh, teaching or instructing meaning? On, sorry, say that again, the, the first part of that question? I didn't hear you. Yeah, why is, why, why have you spent your, um, your why, did you, why did you focus your thesis on current interpretations um, rather than um, uh, teaching or instructing meaning? And the example is World War I is more relevant in Australia and Europe than it is in the USA, so meanings continue. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I mean, I don't mean to suggest that it's an either or situation. We have to do both. We, we need good education uh, founded in historical evidence and fact and research. Um, and we do that at the War Memorial as well. We have an exhibit downstairs uh, in the building that has information about World War I. Um, but I think that there are limitations to that approach by itself uh, because not everyone is going to necessarily be receptive to a lecture. Uh, you need ways of enticing people's interests, sort of capturing their imagination, drawing them in so that you have a, a, um, an attentive audience who then is more receptive to, to learning about history and other things. Great, and here's a question about um, Wikipedia. Any thoughts on Wikipedia's effect on collective memory? Is it helping or hurting? Mm, that's a great question. 
Um, yeah, I know. I love Wikipedia. Uh, it, yeah, but it's, um, it, it's kind of a miracle in some ways that, you know, it's still free uh, and that, you know, someone hasn't figured out a way of, of uh, profiting off of it. Um, in that way, it's, it's a great expression of the collective memory as a whole. The fact that anybody can participate, I think that that's, um, it, I think that's a good thing. Uh, I, I have to give it a little bit more thought though. Um, as it relates to monuments, I know that most people, when they see a monument or a memorial and they wanna learn something about it, first place they go is Wikipedia. And so there is still a great responsibility there for the people who write those articles uh, to ensure that they're providing good factual information. Great. Yeah. Um, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yep. Um, the last last question is is about um, like like so. What about like like when you're reinterpreting monuments? Like what what about the danger of losing the original meanings of of those of those memorials and monuments and their intent? Yeah, that's a challenge because we want to introduce new meaning, but you don't want to at the same time erase the old. Um, it's more of a, of a layering process, um, you know, the, and, and we see this with historic buildings as well. Take, for example, High Line in, in New York City. It's a, a great example of adaptive reuse where it's not interpreted as a historic railroad viaduct, um, but you can still go and visit and appreciate the park and also appreciate its past because it still visibly retains the appearance of a historic railroad viaduct. Um, and so that's the kind of creative thinking that I, I advocate for commemorative places as well. Don't tear down the old wholesale, um, but, but try to fold new meaning into the old so that the two have a logical dialogue between them. Great. And we have uh, one more question for you, and it's um, specific to the War Memorial. And the question is about if, if you think that projects like um, like the like Kay's project, which relates directly to war. If that if those are make for better instances of adaptive reuse than say something else like having like an orchestra come and play. Yeah, I think so. I think that that was successful because there was a thread uh, that was um, connected the original commemorative meaning with uh, Ito and and Kuiper's project after him Requiem, and that and that was war. Actually, it was a different war. Um, there's a different way of interpreting war, but there was that commonality. Uh, and that's what I mean by sort of layering new meaning on old. You need to have that point of reference uh, as opposed to just, you know, sticking any kind of random uh, event there. Um, and so I, I think those types of interventions are going to be much more successful at engaging uh, the way people think about these places than, than just picking a random activity. Great, thank you, Jackson. Um, that's that's all the, the time we have today, and I hope everyone can join us next week on May first for the next in our series on uh, virtual histories. You can uh, find out more information on um, on Facebook, or you can go to baltimorearchitecture.org or baltimoreheritage.org to find out more. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It was great. Thank you so much for joining. <laughs>